This week on CrossFeed. British humanists say God is probably not on the bus. What would Jesus brew? Upset at the Crystal Cathedral. And no birth control. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. I'm Dr. Jim Butler, service pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. You may dispense with the pleasantries, Commander. I'm here to put you back on schedule. You have an interesting week, Jim. Had a great week. I, uh, our district pastor's conference was this week. Actually, it's what we call the Tri-District. Uh, Atlantic and New Jersey districts are with us. And uh, we were told we had an excellent conference. Our speaker was California, Nevada, Hawaii District President Bob Newton. He uh, used to be a missionary in the Philippines. And uh, after that, taught at our Fort Wayne Seminary for 13 years. And now is uh, was pastor in the uh, California, uh, San Francisco area and then elected district president. And uh, just an excellent, excellent speaker. Uh, gave a lot to think about. And for us to consider, which was, you know, what you, what you want in this. And even make it even neater, uh, our director of music from St. Luke's became the musician. So uh, that was really cool. And I heard the words every pastor wants to hear. I am so envious of you. I covet your, mu- your director of music. <laughs> and I think, I got him, you don't. Ha. So I want everybody to pause right now and uh, send us an email and tell us, when he said the words every pastor wanted to hear, what were you expecting him to say? <laughs> Podcast at CrossFeedNews.com. <laughs> That's right. Well, speaking of missions, I had, uh, um, I'm on our district uh, missions board and, um, I'm the evangelism guy and, uh, we, I learned something really fascinating today. Did you know that there are books for the deaf? And, and when I say that, I mean like not books about being deaf or something like that. I mean books that are translated to be read by the deaf. Yes, because American Sign Language uh, grammar is not like standard English grammar. Yeah, I did not know that. <laughs> and um, we have, in, in our district, we have uh, like three different uh, deaf ministries and um and three or four but anyway um the guy that kind of runs the show is writing uh, it's kind of going to be his life's work it's it's quite an undertaking he's writing a bible dictionary in american sign language and so it's it's going to be words and signs um but it's it's written using that grammar, so it's written specifically to be read by the deaf, hmm. and um, they're hoping as as sort of by doing this they can then <clears throat> they can make like catechisms. They can you know ultimately translate the Bible into American Sign Language, um, you know, and come up with a written American Sign Language translation, and. Um, so I think that might exist out there, actually. Well, you know, that's what I was wondering. You'd think that somebody must have done it, huh? I mean, geez, there's two different Klingon translations. You'd think somebody would have done an ASL one. So, um, but the idea is that, you know, that this dictionary would help produce a lot more, um, you know, translations of theological works for the deaf. So, um, so it just, I mean, it seemed like a really cool idea and I just, you know, I never thought about it. Think, think about books for the blind, you know, Braille, but I just never really thought about the fact that you would have, um, you know, books for the deaf, you know, it's just, you know, never thought of it. So th- that was my education today. And, and I, you know, I felt, wow, you know, I, I guess I was really ignorant or something, but you know, I just, it's just not something that I never learned about. Or ever hmm. anyway, yeah. So yeah, that was that was cool. But I have a question. Would they have 
bus campaign signs for the deaf. Hmm. <laughs> this is th- this are uh, this whole thing really cracks me up. All right, we've we've got sort of three different stories here. Um, one is uh, the, the the original news story, and then there's a, a blog post about it, which I thought was extremely well written, and uh, and then also a little more information, which later I found out is kind of in the original article, sort of. So, all right, here's the story. Uh, there's an atheist organization um, in England that is going to have signs on the side of their bendy buses. And it is going to say... Um, uh, there's, there's probably no God. Stop worrying and enjoy your life. Yeah. So, Jim, um, you believe in God. So, does that cause you to worry? I know what I must do, if I'm afraid to do it. No, actually, it causes me to enjoy life. Okay, well, end of that story. Next story. You know. <laughs> I mean, you know, here's the thing. Yeah, by by knowing that there's a God, um, you know, we say, great, I don't have to worry. I can let God worry about my problems. That was my... That that's actually if you look at the um anybody that follows the the same lectionary as us, um the that's been a kind of running theme for the past few months it seems like, um in a lot of the texts or at least that's how I've been seeing them. So um and it's actually been I've been going come on I need something else here I'm tired of preaching on don't worry, <laughs> but uh, be happy yeah. <laughs> Um, but the, uh, uh, I I love, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, who, uh, donated, um, $9,000 to this. Yeah. Almost 10%, almost 10% of what they needed. Yeah. But they raised. And, uh, and he says that, uh, oh, where was it? This is great. Oh, um. Religious, oh, he's, Dawkins is complaining. Religious organizations have an automatic tax-free charitable status. Bishops sit in the House of Lords automatically. Religious leaders get preferential treatment on all sorts of commissions. This campaign is to put alternative slogans on London buses that will make people think. And thinking is anathema to religion. All right? So, what did the Church of England do? They donated 50 pounds to the campaign. Because... It'll get people thinking. Well, there goes Dawkins' idea. He's he's saying, oh, it's going to make people think, and that's going to destroy religion. And, and the Anglican Church says, hey, cool, it's going to get people thinking. Let's donate to it. Am I going mad? Or did the word think escape your lips? And, and so did the Nulling today, but uh, the Reverend Jenny Ellis, spirituality discipleship officer for the Methodist, said it's... A good thing. It gets people to engage the deepest questions of life. Yep. And uh, Inayat uh, Bungawala, I'm sure I ruined that name, um, said, I think people, and this is from the Muslim Council of Britain, I think people ask themselves, on what basis can they make that statement? So it'll get people thinking. In that sense, it can only be good. <laughs> so <laughs> all these people are thinking, Oh, no, it's, you know, thinking is bad, thinking is bad. And, you know, and you've heard me say on the show before, when you become a Christian, don't check your brain at the door, you know? And it's, religion is not anti-thinking, right? We want people to think. Man, when I teach confirmation class, I throw all kinds of curveballs at the kids. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say something. And, and all of a sudden they'll go, wait a minute, that. That's not right, is it? <laughs> yeah. No, but I'm glad you're thinking, you know. <laughs> the whole idea is to see if, you know, I mean, I know they're paying attention, but to see if they're really thinking about what I'm saying. And, um, you know, and, and to, to get them thinking about it and to get them to think about things they've never thought of before. And then they throw questions at me that I've never thought of before, you know, and it gets me thinking too, and I love it. See, actually, the thing is just the opposite. Uh, see, I think to, to be a militant atheist 
you almost have to be against thinking because there's so much you have to take on faith. You know, that, you know, the entire world, the entire universe just happened to show up. And that we just happened to show up with this extremely complex, um, you know, uh, a, a this extremely complex design. Can't even think of another word. I mean, you know, that's okay. That you have evolutionists use that too. You know, they talk about evolutionary design. <laughs> you know, but still, that you've got you know all these different, you know, within you know systems that interact within the human body that. And they just all showed up and just all were functioning. And all depend yeah, on each other. On each. Yeah, all depend on each other. And they did, you know, and it just, it's just, I mean, to me, it just, I, I honestly believe it takes a lot more faith to be an atheist than it does to be Christian. Um, I really just, I don't know how they can believe that much. Uh, and the, the sad thing is, is for what? Because you see, the idea that this atheist campaign is, you're going to die. So eat, drink, whatever you're going to do. Go go do it because, pff, hey, life sucks, then you die. <laughs> yeah, and, and so yeah. that's supposed to cause you to worry less and, you know, <laughs> and not really think about it or something. But this is great. And now this is uh, uh, um, from The Independent. And it's uh, Howard Jacobson, who, um, and I, I kind of thought this, but he confirms it um, in the, his last paragraph. He says, I'm not a believer myself. All right. So this is coming from an atheist. And this has got to be one of the best blog posts I've ever read in my life. <laughs> it's just great. Yeah. He's, so he's, he's talking about these buses, and, and uh, first he kind of complains about the bendy buses and, and that. But he says... Um, he says, God probably doesn't exist. You should answer fire and brimstone with fire and brimstone. They aren't saying God probably does exist in Waynesville, North Carolina. They aren't wondering in Colorado Springs whether maybe considering the question fairly and without presumption, God might be allowed to be a viable, though grandedly complex and vexatious entity. God is, is what they say. God lives, God saves, God hates. He's <laughs> referring to focus on the family. <laughs> but... Um, he says, and I'll read this next one. I'll warn you now that it's he's, he's a little uh, blunt and uh, vulgar. Um, so, you know, if, if that bothers you, just skip ahead a few seconds. Um, he says, you need balls if you're going to swap belief systems with fundamentalists. God doesn't exist. God never did exist. God is cod swallop. <laughs> Something along those lines. And to hell with what advertising standards authority thinks. G say God probably doesn't exist and you've conceded half the argument to believers. It's like saying I probably won't be sleeping with you tonight, which anyone with an ear for linguistic transaction and a modicum of optimism will interpret as a surefire thing you will be. I'm probably not going to let you have your way with me. I'll probably go to bed with my clothes on. I'll probably not keep the baby. Say what you mean for Christ's sake. If you're sure God doesn't exist, then probably doesn't enter into it. And if you're not sure, then you shouldn't be wasting all that space on bendy buses, which should be better used carrying advertisements for quality literary fiction. <laughs> this guy's a genius. <laughs> you know, sometimes I amaze even myself. So, and and then he points out that um, that it, you know there, if you know if if you're gonna do it. Do it, do it with action. You know, he quotes Nietzsche, and, and, you know, Nietzsche was a guy that didn't say God probably doesn't exist. Um, and, and then. And he didn't say God is probably dead. Yeah. But, but then he's got this great thing that I agree with him absolutely. He says, um, I prefer it if our atheists made it clear which God it is precisely whose existence they find improbable. Because though Muslims, Jews, and Christians will tell you in the name of peace that they all subscribe to the same God in the final analysis, in the final analysis, and indeed much sooner than that, they don't. Change your theology and you change your God. The Christian God who plunked his son on earth to redeem our sinfulness is not the fastidiously indivisible Jewish God to whom such an act would have been inconceivable. God is how we interpret him, and since he isn't answerable to our interpretations, I don't see the point in denying him. So, um, this is a, a breezy universal atheism is a cowardly position to adopt. 
So I, I have to agree. You can't say that, you know, I mean, I, I disagree with saying that all Christians would say, yeah, we all believe in the same God. I do agree that, no, they're all different, you know? And yeah, God is defined on by his, his characteristics. What I would argue is that um, <clears throat> yes, they're different. Uh, at the same time, also the same. I mean, what's different is is, ultimate, is you're talking about the hidden God versus the revealed God, to use Luther's terms. Mm-hmm. But on another hand, on the other side, I was um, listening to someone speak this week. Uh, and they're talking about uh, they were uh, at, a, at a at a football game tailgate party, and the sponsor asked him to have a prayer. So this pastor has this prayer, and um, thanks God for you know the food for you know everything, and above all we thank you for your beloved Son Jesus who died on the cross for us and rose from the dead, and we pray in His very precious name. Well, one of the um, people came up to him, and. Um, Happened to be a, a an ortho, practicing Orthodox Jew, his uh, who was married to a Lutheran, and so they at this game, and uh, so uh, and so he started talking to him about you know I I really you know you had me right up to that part you know when he started talking about Jesus and he says you know he says you know isn't there an acknowledgement that that we Jews and, and the Muslims and the Hindus are, are all trying to take our ladders and work up to God? You know, and, and all trying to get up there. And this pastor talked to him some more, and he says, you know, about that. And he says, you know, first off, I want to thank you for sharing your Messiah with me. Yeah, I'm a dog of a Gentile. He says that, but, you know, you, you, you know you've heard me to, to have your, your Messiah, and I, and I appreciate that. He says, you know, the question is, is this, how high does that ladder have to be? How, how much does that ladder have to go up? Now, how do you know you've made it? Whether you're, you know, the Jew or the Muslim, how, 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 you know, how do you know that ladder is, is making it all the way? He says, for us, God has put a ladder, it's too high. And so God has put a ladder down. And that ladder's through his son. And he's come to us. He says, the question is, is which way is the ladder going? And, the, you know, he says, this Jewish guy says, I've never heard it that way before. I've never thought of that. Now, the thing is, is once you, you know, make that analogy, you're, you're basically saying it's the same God. Yeah, fair enough. You know, that's there's an unspoken assumption there. Mm-hmm. You know. But you're talking very differently, though, about the God that I think is there and the God who's revealed himself in his son. Mm-hmm. So that's why and there you, you're talking about the God of natural revelation. Right. But, I mean, you know, regardless, the I mean, his his point, which, you know, we both agree with, is that these are, you know, how you define God. You know, for one, not all roads lead to God. Um, nope. which is the point that you made. And, um, you know, I was told a couple of weeks ago to get out from, or what rock have I been under that, and that God would be ashamed of me and all kinds of stuff, um, you know, for saying that, that Jesus is the only way. So, um, but you know, that's what Jesus said. So, uh, I believe him. Um, and, <laughs> and quite frankly, I really wish that that weren't the case, you know? I wish that Jesus has said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm the son of God and, you know, and, and, and faith in me saves, but there's lots of other ways too, because then I could relax and not have to worry. And I wouldn't have to go around telling people that, um, you know, that, that this is the only way. And, and, uh, and it, it would make my life a whole lot easier. Um, but God is who he is and he said what he said and, uh, there's nothing I can do about that. He's God. So, so, but, I mean, because God is who he is, because not only to take that ladder analogy, not only is he, is he brought the ladder down. <laughs> um, not only has he brought the, the ladder down, um, 
he has taken hold of us, attached us to the ladder, and um, and held on to us and pulled us up all the way. So, yeah, he says, uh, your liberal atheists would have trouble following the moral logic um, that since there's probably no God, it would, um, <clears throat> you can, uh, wait, I got to back up, sorry. Um, he says, why should the non-existence of a God stop us worrying? Whoever claimed it was belief in God that caused us to worry. Some of the least worried people I know are unworried precisely because they believe in a benign creator who takes individual care of them. You know, we may think of them as deluded crackpots. We might be driven crazy ourselves by their baseless blitheness and serenity. But if not worrying is to be the measure of happiness, then like it or not, they found happiness in spades. So, and, and he says that, you know, really, if there's no God, then everything is permitted. And, uh, and we all have plenty to be worried about. I got a bad feeling about this. So, um, yeah, just fascinating. I encourage, you know, here, here we go. I'm, I'm encouraging everybody to go and read this atheist blog, <laughs> but it's great. I mean, he's, uh, actually the problem with that link is it's dead. I oh yeah, open that's it right. Open oh, open. That's right. I had a, so. I had to Google it. So I managed uh, to get, you know, find it on another blog in order to find the whole story, but, uh, appreciate you, uh, sharing it i'll uh, okay I'll, I'll post an extra link if i remember okay so next question then what would those uh atheists do at a beer festival that has religious beer now this is i love this what can I say? I, I love this story. This is a great story. The Great American Beer Festival is held out in Denver every year. Um, matter of fact, my older brother, Kenny, won several blue ribbons for his beers at this festival. So uh, I'm quite familiar with it. And um, there are several religious groups out there that had beer. Uh, for example, there was the Lost Abbey of San Marcos, California. And, uh, you know, they... they they had their um, uh, ale uh, inspired beer for saints and sinners alike. And um, there's a story of good and evil, the good beer and those who make evil beer. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, and he has this great. I don't know if you can you can you can see it uh, behind it's kind of on picture behind me there. But, you know, banner there saying, what would Jesus brew? And, uh, with Jesus with a paddle mash in one hand and, uh, ale glass in the other. Um, and of course, you know, there, there, there was for years, I mean, I mean, the, 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 the monks were, you know, the brewers. Um, and then there was another beer that, uh, named after St. Arnold of Metz, the French saint of, uh, brewers. Um, who said, don't drink the water, drink beer. Because <laughs> yep, he believed the water boiled in beer was safer than tainted water sources. Right. And then my, my favorite was Hebrew, the chosen beer. <laughs> <laughs> yep, Jewish beer. Yep. So, so yeah. You, you yeah, figure it's ale. Uh, kosher? Oh, and he says it's says all the more kosher. Genesis Ale, our first creation, Messiah Bold, the one you've been waiting for, and Jubilation, Lashayim. <laughs> yeah, it says, I'm passionately Jewish. I don't get caught up in the legal minutiae. I'm more fascinated at the in the project of Judaism as a civilization. This is the way I participate. <laughs> he sounds Lutheran. <laughs> right. although, although, he... Um, you know, it was not there the first day because it was Yom Kippur. So he, he did, you know, apparently he is observant. So I just thought, I just thought, man, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, there there are drawbacks to this. They, uh, you know, we've got this. Yeah, we weren't there. <laughs> we've got this quote from the uh, St. Arnold Brewing Company. The purpose of religion is the, or uh, one of the, wait, 
one purpose of religion is the formation of communities. Eh, I question that. But, um, and our brewery kind of has that effect to bring people together. Um, he described himself as spiritual, but weary of organized religion. Some of our regulars say going on our brewery tour is going to church. Okay. We can smile and laugh at that. And, but we laugh because we know it's all too true for a lot of people. And that's not a good thing. All right. So, you know, as, as we talk about this, you know, it's, it's important to note that. All right. First of all, it's important to note that Jim and I are Lutheran. Lutherans are kind of famous for the whole beer thing. Um, you know, Lutheran juice or, you know, different terms like that. And, um, you know, the, the story goes that, uh, you know, you look at pictures of Martin Luther in his later years and he's kind of a big guy. And, um, that was because, uh, Katie had her own little brewery and, uh, his wife. And so that was a beer gut. So, um, but, you know, we're not in favor of, uh, of over drinking and, uh, drunkenness, of course. No, um, absolutely not. Beer is a food. It is to be enjoyed, um, as a, as a, as a good fine wine. You know, it's just, see, I don't like your typical, I don't like your, your Budweiser, your Coors. That's, that's just, ugh. Might as well drink colored water, uh, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, but, I mean, it's, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the equivalent of boxed wine, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, a good microbrew, a good craft ale, you can taste the flavors and the, the hops and had a wonderful barley ale. Never had barley ale before, but I had that up in Vermont for one of our conference. It was wonderful, uh, with lunch one day. Um, I, actually, I had it at the Trap Family Lodge. Went over there for lunch, uh, and uh, so it was just a, a marvelous uh, thing. But you know, actually, that guy's right because one of the important parts of religion is to build community. Because you think about it, where are people finding community today? You know, we're in such a mobile society; families spread out all over. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, uh, uh, work doesn't always develop that community. The neighborhood, the, your community, is not, for a lot of people, it's not your neighborhood because, you know, you all sleep there and drive 30, 40 miles away. So where do you find a, a, a strong community? Yeah, at the same sure? time, <laughs> you know, just saying, well, we build community doesn't necessarily make you the equivalent of a religion, though. No, no. and it, it, But it is an important role that we do play. and But, we, we, you know, we build real community, community that comes through through the presence of Christ community that comes through his death and resurrection i mean you know um you know to say you know a tour of my brewery we have a great brewery here in boston um uh, harpoon and they give wonderful tours they have a marvelous ipa but i would never you know and they also have a really good uh hyperweizen things how you say it it's a wonderful unfiltered wheat beer it's a great great brew but that's not a religious experience to go there, you know, and to say, yeah, this is this is, this is going to church for me. There's a difference between the spirit and spirits. That's yeah, true. Um, but you know, I I like this uh, this uh, quote from Benjamin Franklin: "Beer is living proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy." Um, and uh, and they also talk about the. Uh, let's see, before Louis Pasteur pinpointed yeast as the culprit in the 1850s, brewers didn't know what caused fermentation. Um, president of the uh, Boulder, Colorado-based Brewers Association. So they invented one run-on word to describe the mysterious stuff at the bottom of the bottle. God is good. <laughs> so as you drain a glass of beer, look at the yeast at the bottom and be reminded that God is good because that's the way it feels. Uh, speaking of uh, of, of d different uh, kinds of beer and different things to brew it out of, uh, there's a pastor here in this district that um, does a lot of his homebrew stuff, and uh, he was telling us that he made one out of grape nuts, and uh, <laughs> he just he, he, you know he was, he was he was eating some grape nuts. He kind of looked at the box. He thought about it. And went hmm, wonder if it would work, <laughs> and it did. <laughs> he said it was pretty good. <laughs> so it's uh it's what you call drinking your breakfast. 
hops, malt, barley. Yeah, that's all in there. Okay, yeah. So. So I, yeah, okay, but here's, I do have to ask the question, is this simony? I mean, you know, sort of using Jesus' name to, to make money. The great Keith Green once said, there's money to be made in Jesus' name, and the world is going to make it. I mean, is it any worse than, you know, magnets with Jesus' name on it? Or, you know, egg separators that say, nothing will separate us from the love of God. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I mean, a few years ago, oh gosh, more than 15 years ago, I had to be. Uh, the Wittenberg Door asked people to go out and find the goofiest thing that they could find in a Christian bookstore with Jesus' name on it or something that, you know, was less than two bucks. You know, you know, and that was one of them, this, this egg separator, or I can't remember some of the other things, but the winner was the Critter Cross. You've talked about that one before, but go ahead. Yeah, and that was the one. That's why, that's why I stopped right there. See, before we started playing the drinking game, yeah. I stopped right there. <laughs> I didn't go and do it, but, um, but they, they said that was the goofiest thing. Not only did somebody found the goofiest thing ever, but, uh, you know, but I mean, Keith Green called it, uh, Jesus junk. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, you know, I, I didn't take offense at it. I thought it was kind of fun. And simony, by the way, is not using Jesus to sell something. Simony is buying a church office. Oh, okay. I, I'm sorry. I have to mix it up. Um, okay. So speaking of buying a church office, let's talk about Robert Schuller. <laughs> well, was, I'm sorry. Father and son. That was a bad transition. <laughs> Oh, you better make Dad happy in this case, boy, I'll tell you. All right. So, you know, Robert Schuller, Hour of Power, uh, Crystal Cathedral, all right, 20 million people watching. Yeah, notice they're both smiling in this picture. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. So a while back, um, and I found some more information besides the the, the, the link in the um, on the site is to a very short story. But if you just, you know, Google Schuler and Google News, you'll find the more information. Uh, I found this in the LA Times. And, um, basically, th- uh, Robert Schuler, okay, it's, it's not junior and senior, it's. H and A. H and A. H is the older one, A is the younger one. Okay. All right, but just call them junior and senior, it's easier that way. So, yeah, all right. So, um, so senior. Uh, was retiring, and so Junior was going to come in and, and take his place, okay? But then the board of directors and that and and Senior, they decided that they needed to have more than just the name Schuler attached with the ministry or the mission, as they put it. Because um, they said uh, the real minister's name that we honor is Jesus, not Schuler, right? The eighth under supplies, all right. Except, all right. I just, before we go any further, we need to understand Robert Schuller's theology, all right. And he he kind of sums it up nicely. Um, he says, "I was called to start a mission, not a church." There's a difference. You don't try to preach what sin is and what isn't sin. A mission is a place where you ask non-believers to come and find faith and hope and feel love. We're a mission first, a church second, all right. If you ever listen to one of Robert Schuller's or all of Robert Schuller's sermons, right? He never mentions sin, and therefore he never mentions the atonement from sin, which is the whole point of preaching. Okay, but he's against it, and all right, I'm not making this up. I listened to an interview with him. He was on issues, etc., a while back, and um, and the the he whole, actually was yeah yeah. And uh, uh, Todd Wilkin, the the host, um, was you know he kind of he said what you don't you don't use and no I don't I don't use the word sin I never talk about sin you know I mean he came right out and said it that you know that's not what he's about so okay um, then go home you know find another job if you're not going because I'm sorry but if you're a pastor your job is to tell people what sin is, that sin is bad, and then 
preach forgiveness. But you can't preach and forgiveness. That they are sinners. Yeah. And and you but if you're not a sinner, you don't need Jesus. So, okay. So that's and, well, and, and, and if you read him, I mean, he's really and furthermore, not only that, but he's also um, very much a, a, a disciple, and he, and he is a disciple of, uh, you know, Norman Vincent Peale. That that positive thinking. I mean, I remember his book on the Beatitudes are the Be Happy Attitudes, or uh, uh, Tough Times Never Last, but Tough People Do. So it's you know. So he's like one of those, you know, motivation posters. That, what do you call yep. those things? Um, inspirationals or something like that. Yeah. I can't remember what the. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, okay, so continue then. So. Um, so he wanted to. He he's actually talking about. Um, it's going to be hosted by different pastors and even businessmen from around the country in Latin America. So not just even other pastors, you know, <laughs> when you're not preaching the gospel, you know, that's pastor's job is to preach the gospel. So if we're not going to preach the gospel, we can put anybody in the pulpit. <laughs> okay. So he said, um, you know, they have different ideas as to the direction and vision for this ministry is quoted in Fox news. Did the LA Times go into any more detail about what that's about? Um, you know, he kind of he he never comes right out like in his whole speech about all of this, he never once mentioned his son. But everybody knew that's who he's talking about. So it's kind of like the elephant in the room. And um so but well he says that um when asked whether his son wanted to turn the Crystal Cathedral into a church rather than a mission, uh, Schuler declined to answer, then said, but I think it is a wise question. Mm. Sounds like Yoda. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the other one is because it says that Junior will remain the senior pastor of the Crystal Cathedral, although it was unknown whether he will continue to preach. Yeah. Well, if he's not preaching, what is he doing? <laughs> uh, see, interestingly enough, most people don't realize this. The The Crystal Cathedral is not owned by the church. It's owned by Robert Schuler Ministries Incorporated and leased to the church. Huh. Um, it was originally built by the, the built by the church, but um, I remember reading this article that they, they yeah that that uh, uh, that they sold it to Robert Schuler Ministries and they, I mean, it's, it's a phenomenal lease. I think it's like a dollar a year or something like that. It's, it's nothing. But the fact is, you know, the congregation doesn't own the building. He does. Huh. So Schuler said that by expanding his ministry, he would be immunizing himself against glorifying myself. And it seems to be too late for that. <laughs> you think? I mean, you know, I mean, honestly, if he's saying immunize myself against glorifying myself, no, it's immunizing against glorifying his son because he's retiring. So if he's retiring, it has nothing to do with him anymore. It has everything to do with his son. Oh well, I don't want, you know, I don't want my son to get too big of a head. It's, it's already crowded in this house, you know. <laughs> so. I don't I, 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 I don't really blame his son for being a bit miffed about the whole thing. Um, but the, the whole thing is just kind of crazy. <laughs> a couple of our members, um, when a couple of years ago, uh, they were in the area and they decided they were part of this tour and, and part of the, the tour went to the Crystal Cathedral. <laughs> I said, well, what'd you think of it? I said, what a tremendous waste of money. <laughs> well, he talked about that, actually, why he built it that way. He gets this to Southern California. You've got to get something that's going to catch people's attention. You know, it needs to be big and glitzy. You know, that was that was his thing. It, you, see, you know, your people, you, 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 you know, they're not thinking in terms of marketing in Southern California, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's what he's thinking of. You know, he's thinking of marketing in Southern California, you know. It's not a direction I would go, but I, but I, you know, I was, um, I remember one time, you know, he had Dr. Laura there speaking on a Sunday morning. 
She's at Jewish. The time with, Jewish. At the time was an Orthodox Jew. I don't know what she is now. Because um, I remember for a while there, she was going to give up. Uh, she was no longer going to be an Orthodox Jew because she just like. And it's interesting because she said, you know, I hear I hear people talking about, you know, Jesus like he's their best friend. Uh, I don't have that kind of relationship with God. I'm looking for it. But anyway, but still, you know, at the time she was this practicing Orthodox Jew, and he asked for speaking. Yeah. Maybe at a, yeah. you know, a midweek thing, I could mm-hmm. see us hosting, but I, not Sunday morning in the middle of the service. Yeah. Yeah, as the, as a service, you know, I could see as a guest speaker for a discussion of something. I mean, like, you know, you go down to the our St. Louis Seminary, and they get all kinds of guys in there for, you know, as guest lecturers, but they don't preach in the chapel. You know, they go in the auditorium, and they, you know, and they speak there. But, you know, when you've got no theology to begin with, Somebody else's non-theology isn't really gonna make any difference. Yeah, so, I don't know. Um, they had, uh, uh, who's this person? Um, oh, just a, a member that says, it's not about a church in the name of its pastor, it's about reaching out to Jesus Christ. It's about reaching out to people who don't want to label themselves. No, it's actually, it's about Jesus Christ reaching out to us. Um, so there's that ladder again. <laughs> But, you know, if, so here, here's my gimmick, all right? Um, we preach Christ and Him crucified. And uh, it's kind of a unique thing. There's not a lot of churches doing that nowadays. And so that's our gimmick. Oh, goody! So, I don't know. Yep. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. A, a lot of churches don't. Um even evangelical churches don't. When I was at Gordon Conwell, okay, you can get the get, get your beer if I told you the story before. But um, I remember when I when I was sitting there talking with some of them, and I talked about the necessity to preach Christ in the cross. And I mean, they, they're like, "Well, that's not important to us." I mean, they know that people know that. Mm-hmm. You know, we need to help them know how to live good lives. Um, they know the they know the cross, and um, you know. And somebody else said, uh, you know, what well, the important thing to them is not that they preached Christ, but that they preached the truth. You know better than to trust a strange computer. The sky is blue and the grass is green. Well, you know, you know, but you know, out of out of the Bible, <laughs> they would preach the truth. So they would have you know how to sermons and and biblical principle sermons, and those are all true things. But there's no need to get all the way to the cross of Christ and him to him risen from the dead. And again, the idea is the people already know that. No, they don't. And, no, they don't. And and even the ones that do, you know, it's like I always say that, you know, I love and, you know, I'm sure that people have heard me say this before. All right. My wife tells me she loves me. I know she does before she says it. But man, I love hearing it over and over. Well, the you know it goes back to actually the, that 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 song. I love to tell the story. You know, the, uh, uh, um, you know those who know it best are hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the truth. I need to hear it. Yeah. Um. I and then oh, awesome, awesome sermon uh, at our conference, and just really, oh, it was just spoke the world to me. So it was great. Uh, I don't have a well, transition. Well, I don't know. I, <laughs> nah, I, I don't have one. <laughs> I just, I, I can't. Uh, <laughs> we're transitioning from Robert Schuller to birth control. <laughs> I just. <laughs> I well, you know, if they'd used it, it may have ended this problem. But <laughs> at least it wouldn't be a family problem. <laughs> All right. This is a topic that we've talked about in the past, um, but it's it's come up again. And um, well, we talked about it in Wisconsin, where um, uh, there was a, um, you know, uh, they, they had a pharmacist who refused to dispense birth control and wouldn't transfer the prescription um, and got sued for it. Uh, well, now in Virginia, there is the Divine Mercy Care Pharmacy. 
and uh, looks to be a very small pharmacy for the pictures. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, absolute, the guy <laughs> with that kind of name and has a, and I don't know if I, well, you can, I don't know if it comes through in that picture there. There's a picture of Jesus on the wall and in another picture, there's a cross with a heart on it. Uh, the guy's a very devout Roman Catholic and, um, so says, you know, he is not selling any birth control in his store whatsoever. Um, and, um, the Ar- Anglo Arlington Bishop Paul Loverty, L O V E R D, um, came in and blocked the place. Yeah, he sprinkled holy water on the shelves. So, so now you're, uh, you know, you're Tylenol and your acne medications, you know, clear cell or whatever mm-hmm. is blessed. That one. You go in there and get some blessed notos. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, well, it's interesting too, but 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 because it, there's no soda, there's no, you know, no none of the other junk. I mean, you know, I, I often laugh at uh, the the local quote drugstore because there's you know almost, you know, the the, the, the pharmacies are you know the, the real small part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, they always have been. I mean, uh, I remember you know ours having you know back in when I was in Concordia, Missouri, the whole town shut down on Sunday except for the uh, grocery store. And the drugstore, it could be open half the day, uh, and the drugstore, you know, sold toys. So I was the only place you could buy toys on a on a <laughs> on a Sunday in the town. It was, you know, couldn't go down to the the any of the other stores in town and do it. Um, or the uh, Topsy's Cafe was open, which made a mean Sunday. So uh, you know, that was the only thing. Uh, and of course, they also had uh, they, they you know a lot of drugstores were famous for their soda fountains. The the closest drugstore. Did you ever do that as a kid, going to the soda fountain at a drugstore? Um, no. There there is actually a soda fountain at at our local drugstore. Um, you know, kind of a kind of a retro thing. Um, it's also the um, the closest place to buy comic books. Um, but they, I you know, I'm always amused at these you know drugstores all about people's health. And it's also it, drugstores are always the best place to find candy. They they've got the the greatest candies and snacks and stuff. There's all this stuff that's really bad for you, but it's but good. not at Divine yeah. Mercy Care. Nope. No soda. Nope. No candy. No birth control. Nothing that's no not healthy. Control. No birth control. Uh, it's the only things that are health related: vitamins, skin care products, medications. Yep. Um. So this is in Virginia, and um, there's some abortion rights groups are calling for a boycott, and they've collected more than a thousand signatures protesting the pharmacy, and uh, and they said that uh, the, the executive director of the this Divine Mercy Care is a chain of of these stores, and uh, he says that he's uh, believes that many of the estimated 50,000 Catholics within a few miles of the store will support its mission and make up for the roughly 10% of business that contraceptives represent to typical, typical pharmacy. It's like, oh, all these abortion rights people are going to boycott the, the store. Fine. They don't want their business anyway, you know? But when you've got all these Catholics in the area... Now, there's, it also says that, uh, according to uh, uh, Gallup poll, uh, 75% of U.S. Catholics said you can still be a good Catholic even if you don't obey church teachings on birth control. But, you know, chances are, I'm thinking that even Catholics that think that birth control is okay, if they want to go down and, and you know, um, pick up a bottle of Tylenol or, or need some other prescription filled, um, they're still going to go. You know, they're not going to boycott it for that reason. They're going to say, hey. Well, reality know. is you can do almost everything else you want there. So, I mean, I don't think, you know, people are going to go, oh, well, they don't offer birth control. I'm not going to go there. I mean, if you need your prescription filled for, um, I don't know. Uh, for for your for your for your your heart pills or your uh, yeah, antibiotics if I need it for my uh, uh, my lava statin, um, you know, if it's cheap, you know, if it's a good price, I'll have it filled there. 
I'm yeah. not going to worry about it. Yeah, if you need condoms, go to Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, I can't figure out. I, I was like, 10% of their profit is birth control? But it seems awfully high to me. Yeah, I thought so, too. But, you know, well, you know that <laughs> there's, that's not just pills, you know. Now, one thing I do want to mention in here, because it talks about uh, the morning after pill as contraception, right? The morning after pill, and I've said this before, and it kind of goes without saying, but we need to say it anyway, that the morning after pill is not contraception, it's an abortifacient. And, um, you know, it causes abortions. It's not, it, it doesn't, it's not contraception. The only way they can call it contraception is because they redefine contraception to mean implantation instead of fertilization. Um, even though up until about uh, 20 years ago, all the medical journals all defined it as fertilization. Then they renamed it so that it would fit in with, you know, with their political agenda. So, uh, and and for that matter, I'll even mention, and, and people should know this and understand this, that even the pill you know, what normally think of, um, most of those, part of the way that they work is now mainly they work to, uh, prevent conception in the traditional sense. Okay. But if that fails, part of the way it works is that it does thicken the, uh, the lining of the uterus and, um, it greatly decreases the chance of implantation. So there is, it's a very small chance, but there is still a chance that it could cause, um, a spontaneous abortion. I mean, you'd never know. Um, but, uh, you know, I think people need to know that and they need to, uh, you know, to be able to make an informed choice, whether that's something that they're comfortable doing or not. So, you know, it's just, it's something people need to know that, they generally don't talk about. And I've, I've talked to lots of people, nurses, pro-life nurses who say, uh, yeah, but the chance of it happening is so microscopic that, you know, I'm so comfortable, uh, you know, recommending this to people. And, um, you know, and, and I know other people that say, uh, you know, even that microscopic chance isn't a chance I want to take. So, uh, you know, people need to make up that, make that decision for themselves. But uh, I think it's important that people be able to make that as an informed decision. So, sort of off, sorry, kind of off topic, but I think it's important information. It's not very common information. So, you know, I, I look at this and I, I think that if you own the store, you should be able to sell whatever you want. I mean, if you own a grocery store and you don't want to sell bread, fine. If you own a drug store and you don't want to sell Tylenol, fine. Right? Or, you know, or, or if, or if you own a drug store in this case and you don't want to sell contraceptives or abortion pills, fine. You shouldn't have to. It's your store. You should be able to sell whatever you want. And, I mean, are there exceptions to this? If we're in trouble. I mean, I mean if, if you don't like it, open your own store and compete with them and put them out of business. You know? <laughs> I just... Yep. I, I, I don't know. It, it just seems like kind of a dictatorship when we say, um, no, you have to sell this product. Like, this law has been brought to you by Procter & Gamble, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, they got a thousand signatures. Well, given the population, that probably isn't a hard thing to get. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's a lot more people there. So, if you don't like it, you know, go to CVS. Mm -hmm. Go to Walgreens. Yeah. Plenty of them out there. Mm, that's so, it. Which brings us then to the end of our show today. Yep. Well, we only had four stories, but the first one we had three uh, different, a couple different links on. Um, actually, I was kind of surprised this time because a lot of the stories didn't have that many hits, uh, as opposed to some of the stories we did last week. So, you know what that means? That means we need you people to help us out. Mm -hmm. We need you to go and 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 take a look through, click through the stories, so we, we find some good stuff. We need you to submit stories. I mean, it's not hard. Uh, 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 Dale's got this really cute, uh, neat little doodad that'll go right on your browser and says crossfeed this. And if you find a story you like, uh, it'll put everything. You can you can blue you you can click in what part of the text you want for the story. 
hit that sucker, and it'll bring everything except the URL. Um, yeah. For some reason, when there's an upgrade, I've, that, that, man, that, 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 that's a good thing. Trying to figure that out, and I just can't figure it out. So, so you have to do an extra copy and paste. You know, it's really hard. You know, to do the to put the URL up there. But uh, you know, it takes all of like you know five extra seconds. Mm-hmm. But it, it put you know put the web link up there, and and if you want to throw a comment on on the story, just today, um, I was um, looking at perusing Fox News. Actually, I was finding how the stock market was doing, and they had an article there about a piece of pottery that may uh, prove David existed. Old, supposed to be the oldest Hebrew writing, and so I said, "Hey, this looks interesting," and I just clicked it and stuck it up there. So uh, it doesn't take a thing. We could use your your stories. We really could. And the other thing is for every story you get, there are three points that you're awarded. Now, I don't know what you get for these points, but you get them. You know, that's, it's, oh, it's all just climbing that ladder, man. You know? <laughs> right. You, know, you get so, to those you pearly gates. And, and get as high as Dale. You know, Dale, Dale then, the master. Right? St. Peter's going to be standing out there and go, how many points did you have at crossfeednews.com? And, yeah. You know, I, I've got like 5,000 or something like that, so I'm good to go. So, right. I, I'm not even at 1,000 yet, folks, you know. But that's only because when I really had to start having the time and finding the stories and stuff, it didn't count points for a while. And I was just like, but then when he upgraded, the points came back. I was like, and he even remembered how many I had. So I thought, that was cool. But, you know, it was supposed I, to be, I, I, I should have at least, track you know, time. You know I, have, I should have at least, you know, 50, you know, at least 150 more points than, than it says I do. But I won't argue with the computer. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you've got other comments. Maybe you've got other issues. Podcast at crossfeednews dot com. Yep. And uh, and also you can um, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Twitter name is Crossfeed News. And uh, and if you do, if you're one of our listeners and you're following me on Twitter, because a bunch of people are following me that I don't know who they are, um, send me just like send me a a little at reply thing, and and let me know that you're a listener, okay? And uh, and I'll follow you back because I. I don't have time to follow everybody, but I'd love to, you know, to follow some of our listeners. So just, just send me real quick, just send a little at CrossFeed News and, uh, and let me know you're, li- that you're there out there and, and I'll follow you back and love to have some conversations with you. So. Uh, the other thing is along with that. Oh, don't forget, by the way, next sun, next Tuesday for our United States listeners, please go out and vote. Yep. I believe it is part of our Christian duty to do so, and I'm going to, even though I know my vote won't count in Massachusetts. So, <laughs> you know, it's just, but uh, I do believe it's a good part of good Christian citizenship. Yep, yep, absolutely. And don't forget to um, change your clocks, or you're going to get it to church an hour early. That's right. Thank so, you. If if you do, get me to the church on time. Spend that hour praying. For your pastor and let him know man he would really appreciate that do it anyway even if you do fix your clocks that'd be really cool i had a, be really cool i had a phone i gotta tell you this real quick speaking of praying for pastors sure um i i got a, a phone call it was a telemarketer and um and and i you know, generally telemarketers, you know, they're like looking for a youth leader or something like that. And I, our youth leaders, well, our youth leader actually right now is my wife and, um, you know, she wasn't there. And, uh, and so I said, look, you know, if you got some stuff, just mail it to us and, you know, secretary will see to it. It gets into the right hands. And, um, that's kind of my standard response. And, um, she says, is there anything that, um, that you'd like us to pray for you? Uh, well, you know, I just want to pray to remain faithful. Okay. You mind if I say a prayer right now? Pray with me. Sure. <laughs> and, and, you know, and she set up a prayer that, you know, that God would be with our ministry and, you know, with our church and uh, help us to remain faithful and, and focus on the mission of the church and all that kind of, uh, you know, it was really cool. I was like, hey, I could, I could use more telemarketers like that. You know, so 
I thought I thought that was really really cool. So um, first time I ever hung up from the telemarketer, and I was happy about the call. <laughs> so yeah, it sounded cool. So so. All right. Well, thanks everybody for uh, watching and uh, send us your comments. Uh, email us or, or if you're watching this on YouTube or wherever, one of those, uh, just leave a comment right there and we'll get it. And um, and thank you, thank you. Let tell your friends about us. And uh, and good night everybody. And God bless. Bye.